Hello and welcome to Mary Live. This is Dr. Mark Mervali. My friends, on December 8th, we celebrate the Solemnity of the Immaculate Conception. I just want to say from the beginning, nothing I say is going to do any type of justice to the sublimity of what we're celebrating. Uh, because it's something ultimately words can't express, but we have to try anyway. And so in trying, this is as close as we can get. We're celebrating God's greatest human masterpiece. After the sacred humanity of Jesus Christ, there's no greater creation, let alone creature, than Mary at the moment of her immaculate conception. Far beyond the angels, beyond the saints, she is God's masterpiece. And quite frankly, anybody who thinks you can make reference to a masterpiece without the glory redounding to the master is just being a little bit irrational. Uh, imagine going into a gallery and, a, and an artist sitting next to their painting and say, oh, that's a beautiful painting. And they say, thank you. And you say, oh, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking about the painting. And they explain, yeah, well, I'm the artist of the painting. And you still carry on. Uh, yeah, I don't care. I'm talking about the artwork. Well, that's irrational. When you venerate God's greatest masterpiece in the Immaculate Conception, you're giving glory to God. It always redounds to the master. But let's, let's focus now on the masterpiece. She is conceived without original sin. She doesn't have the contagion that all the rest of us were conceived with. And she is full of grace. St. Maximilian Kolbe is right. There's something about her very being that has a plenitude of grace. That's why she does say at Lourdes, I am the Immaculate Conception. Thank God then they appreciated private revelations. Now it seems like we have a little bit of an allergy towards them. We barely withstand when God or Our Lady want to talk to us directly to get the world back on the right track. Uh, that's a dangerous allergy, my friends. But the beauty of 1858 and Lourdes and Our Lady's statement, I am the Immaculate Conception, redounded throughout the world. And it should in our hearts right now. Mary is greater than the angels. She's greater, again, than the saints. Arguably, as theologians will say, Our Lady has more grace at the moment of her Immaculate Conception than all angels and saints combined. Why? Because grace isn't measured in buckets. It's not a quantity. It's a quality of love and relation with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so no creature had the love, the, the divine love within her as in the presence of the Holy Spirit, the, the, the Father and the Son, as did Our Lady. And I mention the Holy Spirit in a special way because, of course, St. Maximilian Kolbe is also right, as St. Louis was before him, uh, Louis Marie de Montfort, that Mary acts in a powerful way because she is the spouse of the Holy Spirit and all graces of the Holy Spirit come through her, not through divine necessity, not because God had to do it that way, but through divine disposition, because God wanted to do it that way. So what are we left with? We're left with a human being who is perfect, a human being who was created perfectly, but through her own free will, she kept guard, she kept watch, she uh, increased the state of grace of her perfection. Why? Because every time Mary says yes, she increases in that fullness of grace. That's why theologians have to talk about an initial fullness of grace of Our Lady in what we celebrate with the Immaculate Conception, and then it just extends every time she says yes. She says yes all of her life. That's the beauty of who we're talking about. And you know, Dostoevsky was, I think, far more merrily prophetic than he knew when he said, beauty will save the world. Beauty will save the world. Well, our beauty, the total pulchra, the entirely beautiful one, the mother, she has been sent to save the world. Let's go back to Genesis 3.15. God puts a total enmity, an absolute opposition between the serpent and the woman. And it's the same en enmity you have between their two seeds. It's a total, radical, perpetual 
opposition. That's what the word iba means in Hebrew. So that is the great foreshadowing that Mary will have no part of sin. As, as St. John, John Damascene says, the serpent will not enter this paradise, not the mother, not the new paradise, not the new Eve who will give birth to the new Adam and work together for the salvation of humanity. But let's go back to Genesis 3.15 again. God, God puts enmity between the woman and the serpent. And then what do we have as a fruit of that enmity immediately? She will crush your head, God the Father says to the serpent, and you will bruise her heel. What does that mean? That means the mother is the creature chosen by the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to lead the campaign against Satan. And yes, she will be bruised because she will be bruised in us. We are, we are her remnant. We are her army. And we have great weakness. Uh, as de Montfort says, we, we together form the heel of the Immaculate Heart of Mary that will crush the head of Satan. And if we understand that, my friends, and, and, and take it to today, we can see that the adversary is running rampant. And I, I don't know how many people uh, have to say to me, um, you know, I don't think it's ever been worse. Uh, Satan's all over the place. Satan's going wild. I mean, in all these different ways of talking about the rampage of evil. And they're right. I believe that since Jesus has been, came to the earth, since the incarnation, we've never had so much evil in the human family as we do right now. Before Jesus, that's one thing, but not since Jesus entered human history uh, have we had so much evil. That means we've got to focus on the woman. And that's why it's the immaculate woman in Revelations 12 that is in battle with the serpent, with the dragon, the ancient dragon. So you can see the bookends of scripture bespeak, betoken this battle between God's greatest creature, the Immaculata, and God's most heinous creature, Satan. So why would we be surprised that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit would again call this woman created immaculate to guide us in the battle of the third millennium for souls? So we have to ask the question, which sometimes we, 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 you know, we, we, we don't or, or we, we, we forget to, why? Why was Mary immaculately conceived? Well, there's two huge reasons. Number one, because she was to be the mother of God. And God the Son would receive his perfect, immaculate human nature from a mother who had a perfect, immaculate human nature. He, she, she's the tabernacle of, of Jesus. And sometimes, again, we say these things so often, we, we, we don't ponder the sublimity of these mysteries. What does it mean to have God? God in you for nine months to give flesh to your Redeemer, as, as the hymn of liturgy says, a creature who gives birth to her Creator. So the first reason Mary's immaculate, she's full of grace, is because she's the mother of Jesus, the mother of God, and she's going to give Jesus, as Mother Teresa says, the instrument of the redemption. Oh, but there's a second key reason why she's immaculately conceived. She's immaculately conceived to be the perfect partner, the perfect human partner with the God-man in the great work of redemption. Remember, the Father, to show his omnipotence, is going to use the same three instruments by which grace was lost to restore grace. And what would those three instruments be? A man, a woman, and a tree. And so we have Jesus Christ, the new Adam, as St. Paul says. We have Mary, the new Eve. As all the fathers of the church say, this, this is the beginning of Christianity in its first articulation of who the mother of Jesus is. She's the, she's the new Eve. And there's going to be a tree. It's going to be the tree of the cross. So it's not arbitrary that a woman is involved in the great work of the redemption. Simply put, the second reason Mary is immaculate is so she can be the human co-redemptrix with Jesus, the God-man, in restoring life and grace and peace to humanity. My friends, 
the title Corydemtrix will always be here. It's not going anywhere. It can't. It's a doctrine of the church. And again, it's, it's contained in the very first image we had of who Mary was, and that is she's the new Eve with the new Adam. Well, what are they going to do? They're going to save the world. Second century, St. Irenaeus, uh, that Mary was the, quote, cause of salvation for herself and the whole human race. That's second century. So any later Christian interpretations that would reject this are rejecting the deposit of early Christianity. Mary is the co-redemptrix. It's never going to go away. It's never going to change. But it should be acknowledged. And so we're talking on a dogma day. Uh, the great dogma of the Immaculate Conception, uh, defined on December 8th. And remember, when Blessed Pius IX defined the dogma of the Immaculate Conception, the church was in total crisis. He was in exile um, in a, in a, on an island uh, off the coast of southern Italy. Uh, Masonic forces uh, held the Vatican, uh, the Masonic armies from both south and north. And it was a series of cardinals that came to him and said, Holy Father, this is Blessed Pius IX, Holy Father, proclaim the dogma of the Immaculate Conception and let Our Lady return you to the Vatican and return grace and peace and, and, and protection to the Church. Well, Pius IX agreed to bring Our Lady into a situation of total crisis. It almost sounds like a, a Hollywood movie where he's got to flee uh, the Vatican through a secret uh, passel through... Uh, you know, Castel San Angelo in 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 uh, in the Vatican there in the ex in the uh, on the on the uh, coast of the Tiber in Rome. He went to the mother, and what happened? He is returned, and there's later the proclamation. He of course proclaims the dogma of the Immaculate Conception, and there's later the proclamation of papal infallibility in 1870. That's what happens when you bring the mother into situations of crises. So, my friends, you're going to hear it one more time. We have to do this by proclaiming the dogma of Mary as the mother of all peoples, which includes, which must include her roles as co-redemptrix, mediatrix, and advocate. Why? Because until that dogma is proclaimed, Our Lady will not be able to fully activate her roles to save us. I mean, here's the irony. It's it's Our Lady, and, and she's done this in a great number of individual Marian private revelations, uh, well over 10, and it's always the same message, to acknowledge her role with Jesus in the redemption. And only when that happens will there be her intercession, her full activation of her roles of intercession to bring us the graces of the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, to bring us the graces of the new Pentecost, so the Holy Spirit, her divine spouse, can fully sanctify the world in a dynamic, historic way, and the church that would bring an era of peace. I must say, and I, I say this with all candor, I, I want to apologize to Our Lady in, in, in the name of we, the people of God, that we have been so reluctant so embarrassed in some cases, so ashamed in other cases, so fearful of what others will think, and sometimes the others include other Christians, if, we're gonna, if we would proclaim the truth about her, that she's the co-redemptrix, mediatrix, and advocate. These are doctrines of the church. Are we ashamed? Are we ashamed to bring our mother in like Pius IX did? Are, are, do we think that we'll be judged harshly? Are we really more preoccupied about what other Christians think or what other people think than the power of the Mother of God, the Immaculate Mother, who alone can bring salvation to the world in this new manifestation, a new redemption of the graces of our only Redeemer, Jesus Christ. He's our only divine Redeemer. There's never been a Catholic uh, with his head on straight or his heart in the right direction. Who's ever claimed Mary was a goddess? This is this is nonsense. And quite frankly, it's often a straw man. Oh, people will think Mary's a goddess. Uh, not if they're rational and they believe in what the Catholic Church believes. And can you give me a list of five people 
uh, in the last 500 years that were known, you know, church uh, saints or cardinals or bishops that thought Mary was a goddess, uh, I, I, you're not going to come up with one because that's how outrageous it is. So let's put the straw man away that somehow if we declare, if we solemnly define Mary as the co-redemptrix, mediatrix, and advocate, that, that she these are her, her, her roles, right, as the mother of all peoples, that somehow it's going to lead someone to believe uh, that we think Mary's a goddess or, or that we in fact do believe she's a goddess. It's utter nonsense. People can believe what they want to believe, but look, if the church starts using that model, that method, that we only do what will be satisfactory to other Christians, well, then who's teaching who? And, and who's leading who? Peter, the vicar of Christ on earth. It is Peter who directs the church of Christ. When Peter, the vicar of Christ, when the Holy Father, when the Pope, makes a solemn proclamation that Mary is the spiritual mother of all peoples, Mark my words, my friend, you're going to see a historic, monumental release of grace where people are going to say, wow, where's that from? And the answer is going to be from the Immaculate Mother of God, from the Mother of all peoples, who's also the co-redemptrix, mediatrix of all grace and advocate. Let's put aside fear. And I say respectfully to the leaders of the church, to our cardinals and our bishops, to, to everyone in the hierarchy, Go to the mother as if she is the remedy. Don't go to her as an afterthought or a, or a forethought. Yeah, well, you know, we'll do a nice little procession after we try to fix the problems of the world or, or light a candle before we try to fix the problems of the world. Give the problems, problems of the world to her. Recognize her as remedy. Proclaim her with a fortitude, with a strength, with a, with a filial loyalty that she is the answer she is the remedy. We acknowledge our mother as the spiritual mother of all peoples. You watch how quickly she will unite nations and peoples in ways we couldn't do in a thousand years on our own. That I don't even mean civilly, things like the United Nations. I mean within the church. If we think we can clean up the present challenge in the church, it is gross naivete. Dialogue is fine. We need supernatural intervention, and we need it now. So I beckon you, pray for this fifth Marian dogma, which will be the greatest and the last dogma in Marian history. How, how dare I say that in light of things like the mother of God and the Immaculate Conception, her assumption, her perpetual virginity? Because this dogma will incorporate all those you see, all of those, but will also incorporate Mary, the Immaculate One's free cooperation with Jesus, her suffering, both spiritual and bodily, to be the new Eve with the new Adam and restore grace to the human family. That so deserves our acknowledgement. She's already crowned in heaven as the co-redemptrix, mediatrix, and advocate, but she's got to be crowned on earth along with our free will, our free consent. She's not going to force this. We've got to freely acknowledge her. And once again, I say, I feel just a little bit ashamed that we're so hesitant to acknowledge the mother for who she is and what she can do for us, especially in our present state of crisis. And I can guarantee you one thing. I can guarantee this. It's going to get worse. So how far do we want to let it go before we go to the mother of God, who is the mother of all peoples, the immaculate co-redemptrix, mediatrix, and advocate, to bring us grace redemption and peace because that's the task God has given her as the immaculate conception, as humanity's solitary boast. That's who she is. That's who she wants to be for us. We have to give her our consent. So again, as we said many times, this little prayer, prayer of the Lady of All Nations, of course, your masses, your rosaries, your, your, your offerings of suffering. Everybody knows their suffering less. We know we've all got them. Uh, offering those for the fifth Marian dogma. Pray for the Holy Father. Forget about blogs and personal opinion. Join Our Lady and respond to Our Lady for her request that we pray for the Holy Father and for this proclamation of the dogma. And the prayer, this prayer of the Lady of All Nations, is a prayer given by God, I believe, that has the proper graces to prepare 
for this great proclamation. So let's pray this prayer together uh, on the solemnity of the Immaculate Conception. Pour your hearts out in prayer and supplication for the fifth Marian dogma. So Our Lady will be acknowledged as she deserves to be acknowledged, as she should be so quick to acknowledge this true role and heroic role of the Queen of Martyrs, who also happens to be our, our personal mother. So let's pray the prayer of the Lady of All Nations and let's invoke her for the grace that the Pope, uh, the Church, will crown her with this fifth and final Marian dogma. Mother of all peoples, co redemptrix, mediatrix, and advocate. Let's pray her prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the Father, send now your Spirit over the earth. Let the Holy Spirit live in the hearts of all nations, that they may be preserved from degeneration, disasters, and war. May the Lady of all nations, the Blessed Virgin Mary, be our advocate. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Again, you want this prayer uh, free of charge, uh, Email us at mary at mother of all peoples. Just give name and address, how many prayer cards you want. They'll be there free of charge. Let's do this together. Children honoring the mother who is so deserving of our love and honoring our immaculate mother of all peoples. God bless you all.